you. This is uh, Mitch Kenny. Uh, he's well known for his work on Jurassic Park, Adam's Family, um, Jersey Boy, X-Men, Hangover, and uh, Dracula, among many other very interesting and wonderful shows. Uh, and most currently, Star Trek Picard. And I was hoping that we could start off with, um, can you describe what a normal day working for you is like? Working for me or? <laughs> well, for you working, what does is, what is a, a normal day look like for you as a costume supervisor? Well, I mean, I'm responsible for um, uh, keeping our department running. Uh, uh, I, I help the designer get he or she's look of what we're achieving by um, uh, putting together a good crew, um, uh, getting the equipment, the place to work, uh, a space for us. Um, and then uh, after we get the space and a crew and all that, then we have to figure out, uh, you know, whatever type of show it is, whether it be superheroes or period or modern, are we are we purchasing the clothes? Are we renting them? Are we making them? Uh, some shows are big made to order. Some are, are really just store-bought. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, but a normal day for me is uh, trying to figure out, um, working with the ADs, uh, working out call times for our costumers, and uh, working on schedules and budgets, trying to keep us on budget. and. Uh, you know, these days it's also maintaining a safe workspace. So uh, what got you into costumes in the first place? Well, my, um, my, my brother-in-law was a costumer and my sister was a seamstress. So um, uh, I was in high school and uh, they, uh, they asked me what I wanted to do. And we talked about possibly doing this. And uh, so my, uh, my brother-in-law and sister helped me uh, start the process, although they made it very clear that once uh, I started, they weren't going to help me the rest of the way. It was going to be on my own. So um, that actually worked out really well for me. So what, what was the first show you ever worked on? Well, first of all, I started at Western Costume Company and I worked there for six years. And that was like, uh, that's like going to college for costumers, in my opinion, you know. Uh, I learned so much there. I learned uh, uh, uniforms, I learned period clothing, I learned how to do fittings, I learned how to put clothes together, I learned the terms of the clothes. Um, uh, I, uh, you learn how to work with costumers and meet costumers and designers. And so uh, that's, uh, that was really my true training ground was, was um, uh, Western Costume Company. What are some of the favorite tools you like to work with? Well, I mean, the game has kind of changed a little bit. When I first started costuming, we didn't have the big giant crews that we have now. And there wasn't a lot of, we didn't have a lot of the specialty people like agers and dyers and uh, specialty costumers, uh, there wasn't a lot of that. So you were sort of, um, uh, you had to have a whole kit of stuff that you had to do to age clothes and things like that. So equipment wise, it has changed over the years because, you know, I started off after I left Western, I started off as a set costumer. And so then you have your set costumer tools, you know, of, you know, uh, aging supplies and you know, your steamer and your, your, your uh, leather hole punch and, you know, your lint roller and all the stuff you need to do to keep the actors looking good, you know. Um, so the equipment has kind of changed over the years of, of what you need, depending if you're a set costume or a key costume or a supervisor. Uh, supervising now, pretty much, you know, it's the computer and the iPad and the iPhone and, um, <laughs> and stuff like that. So what was the hardest thing for you to learn how to do for your job? Wow, um, let me say, I don't know if anything was super hard for me. It all came pretty easy, but I will say the most important thing, that's what you're asking. Yeah. I think that's really the key. 
the most important thing is being able to get along with everybody. You know, finding finding that way of communicating with all different types of personalities. That's that is the key to uh, longevity in our business, I think. Um, as far as like, what's the hardest thing to do? I mean, for me, it's a technical computer stuff because, you know, I'm older, I, I didn't come up with that. So, and, you know, I started supervising in days where we didn't have computers. I mean, all we had, I, the biggest thing I had was a beeper. Do you have any advice for uh, learning how to get along with everyone? I'm, I know you're very good at uh, <laughs> get al getting along and in interpersonal, you know, relations i suppose yeah it's not the right you know, one i think you just have to be open-minded and it and understand it everybody is a little bit different you and you don't know because you're working with them you don't know what everybody's background is or what their personal situation is um so somebody could be having a bad day uh related to a personal thing and you may not know that so um i don't react on just somebody's one bad day. Um, meaning if they're, uh, if they're late or if they make a mistake or something, I don't take that one isolated thing as, as you know, uh, that's how they are. Anything you wish you would have known when you started out? Wow, you know, it's funny. Everybody gets in, people want to get in the movie business sometimes think it's all glamorous. And you know, it's not, it's not particularly glamorous. Um, it's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of long, a lot, a lot of long hours. So, um, and costume is very physical too. You know, um, you and I have different jobs, but we're in the same department, but you know, um, the costumer can be, you know, there's a, there's a lot of physical work to it sometimes, you know? especially the set, set costumers do a lot of physical work more than most people think. Uh, lifting things and carrying things around and standing on their feet all day long. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, sometimes getting a half hour lunch on a 15 hour day, you know, um, uh, and standing up all day long. I worked on a show once where uh, a couple of times where the director didn't want chairs. Nobody could sit in a chair. Even the actors didn't have director's chairs. I'm sure you've been in a lot of fitting rooms. What What is your, your best advice for um, dealing with the chaos in the fitting room? Well, um, as a costumer, I, I, I learned a long time ago is to be, um, if you're in there with the designer, sometimes you're in there by you're doing the, co the fitting by yourself. But in these, these days, back in the day, we used to do a lot of fitting. We used to do a lot of shows with no designer. Matter of fact, I would say 80% of TV shows back pre 1990s had no costume designers. They were all done by costumers. They had a men's supervisor and a women's supervisor. And probably 30, 40% of the features didn't have designers either. Like uh, you said, I did Jurassic Park. We did that without a costume designer. There was, there was only four costumers on that show. There were four. You look at the credits, four. That's all there was. There was two set costumers and a men's uh, supervisor and a women's supervisor. That was it. No designers, no assistant designers, no nothing. So in the fittings, I would say, if you're in there with the designer, it is the designer's domain. So you should probably keep your opinions to yourself unless you're asked by the designer. Uh, that's one thing I've learned, you know, is, is, is don't, don't say something uh, to the actor, if it's good or bad, unless the you know, it's the designer's runway there to. You're there to assist, so I would say uh, be ready to you know have your tape measure, have your safety pins, be able to to help out in that area because sometimes you do it without a person of your skill there too. Sometimes you're, you're you don't have a, a made to order person or a shop person in there with you, so you have to do the pinning and the markings and so you have to be ready for that and so um i would say just be prepared uh 
keep your uh, opinions to yourself if the designer's in there. And if it's just you doing the fitting, then obviously it's you, you get to, you know, run the fitting how you want. And, 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 you know, I'm sure you're taking your, uh, your cues from whatever the costume is supposed to look like before you go in. So before you go into the fitting, know, know how the costume is supposed to look and how it's supposed to fit. And then, um, you know, sometimes you get a little pushback from the actor who has a whole different uh, idea of way things are going to go. So you have to be ready for that too. How have you navigated through your career? What motivated you between, you know, going from one show to another show um, or picking one show over another? Um, well, back in the early days, I was just gung-ho to work. Um, I just, I really was, I really loved working. And I didn't like being off. So um, I pretty much would just take whatever got offered to me first. Um, and uh, and then somewhere around the middle of my career, uh, I decided I didn't want to work the set anymore, that I did want to start supervising. So again, when you're when you're starting off in a new position, you kind of have to take what you can get to establish yourself. Uh, so I, when I was a set, I go back for a, for a second. When I was a set costumer, I established myself as a set costumer, but then I started picking shows of people that I really wanted to work with, you know, either an actor or a, or a supervisor or a designer, you know, if there was a really great designer and, uh, they asked me to do the show, you know, that sounded really great to me. Um, and then, uh, when I started supervising, I kind of had to take what I could get to establish myself that I could supervise. And then after that, I have gone back to how I was when I was established set customers. I picked the shows that it's a combination. Designer, do I get to bring some of my crew members with me? What's the, is it a cool location? Um, uh, you know, um, there's all these variables that come with it now that, you know, uh, fortunately I get to pick and choose a little bit so I can pick, you know, well, I don't really want to work with that designer. I don't really want to, I really don't want to go to that location, you know, um, that kind of stuff. So. Uh, what are some of the favorite things that you've worked on? Um, well, one we've already mentioned is Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was really special because, um, we really did do it with just four customers. Um, obviously, we worked with Steven Spielberg. Um, we got to go to Hawaii. But the biggest thing about that show is we were stuck in a major hurricane in Hawaii. And it, it wiped out the entire island, practically. And we were stuck on the island for three days. Uh, we couldn't leave. Half the hotel rooms were uh, destroyed. So people had to bunk up with, if your room wasn't destroyed and, you know, somebody was moving in with you. Uh, or, um, and, uh, and even going into the second and third day, the hotel had announced that they were running out of food and water. So, and we didn't have working toilets. And um, so it was getting grim. Uh, but one thing that that show did was it really bonded the crew together. We became like really good friends and, and uh, uh, it was quite the experience. And then, you know, the movie wound up being an iconic movie on top of all of that. So that, uh, that movie will always stick with me. And then um, uh, one of my favorite movies that I worked with only because he's such a superstar and he's like the nicest guy in the world. And I was a set costumer and I took care of him on that show was uh, a movie called Blaze which most people don't know about, but if you watch Blaze, it's an amazing costume movie. It's in the 50s. Uh, and uh, Ruth uh, Myers is the designer. And um, Paul Newman was the star. And um, for me, I really loved that because Paul was so awesome to work with. And, um, and it's really a great costume movie if, you, uh, if people go back and take a look at that. That's, that's really great. And then- yeah, pretty. And then uh, probably the one that one of the movies I worked the hardest on was uh, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. <clears throat> Again, I was a set costumer on that. 
and that was back before we had uh, these giant crews. I was the set guy on that, and I was the set guy for every single principal guy on that show. I dressed all of them. There was no personal dressers. There was no, you know, we had two set costumers on that show. Uh, uh, a lady who took care of the girls, and I took care of the guys. That was it. What kind of uh, project gets you excited? You know, there's a couple, of, I mean, I know there's so many people who love to work on superhero movies. Um, I'm not really, I, although I have worked on superhero movies and they are kind of exciting. I, I still like a good period movie. You know, that's, that, that's, that's my favorite. You know, it's like a, a Western or a 30s or a 40s or a 50s or even 60s, you know, like even Jersey Boys, which wasn't the greatest movie, you know, it was super cool because we did so many different periods, you know, on that, on that. And uh, so. Costumes are cool though. <laughs> Costumes are cool, yes. Yeah. Yes, Deborah Hopper was designer on that who I've worked eight movies with. She's a really nice lady. And um, yeah, a good period movie is, is uh, you know, that gets me excited. What is the most challenging part of your job? Um, well, nowadays it's, it's really, I think the budgeting part is, is difficult because um, it's so expensive to make uh, movies. And so you have producers who are really crunching the numbers and putting pressure on you uh, to come up with a number that that they think is good and sometimes it's just not realistic. So it's again trying to find a way uh, of coming up with the right number that the supervisor that the uh, producer understands. You know, um, th that's the toughest part is the budgeting part right now. How did you, uh, you initially got your union hours uh, through Western Costume, right? Yes. Yep. Um, how did you know to, was it through your, your family members to, to know to get into the union that way? Yes. My sister said, if you start at Western Costume Company, it's, uh, it was a good uh, uh, way to learn. And you could also get into the union that way. Um, that you had to pull your 30 days there. And, but more important than the union, she said that was the place to actually learn and decide if you wanted to keep doing that. So <clears throat> I started when I was 17. So I didn't really understand the whole union stuff, how important it was. I do now, but back then I didn't. I was more focused on trying to figure out, well, I like this and, and how, you know, learning, learning it. What role have, have uh, mentors played in your career? <laughs> it's funny. Um, I laugh only because I think I have learned more from costume supervisors on not what to do than to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, listen, every single show that you do, and you know this, it's different. The people you work with is different. The show is different. The space you're in is different. The producers are different. Everything is different. So no show is exactly the same. So um, I think on every show, you learn something different. Even now, this is my 43rd year. Every show I learn something different. Something you got to learn from different people. How to, even if it's uh, how to treat somebody or how to react to a certain situation or a little tidbit about a costume you, you didn't know or a little trick from a, from a seamstress or a made to order person or an age or dyer or, you know, um, so I think, I don't know if I had one like major mentor, but I did have a lot of people that I learned a lot of things from. That is one of the purposes of, of these videos is so that people will know that we exist <laughs> to, to yeah, a point. So there, was, there was this guy in Western Costume. His name was Bob Pacina. He worked at Western Costume for 40 years. 
And when you, and, and he never left, he worked at Western the whole time. And when you looked at this guy, he was amazing. He had, he wore like cream colored pleated pants, uh, a beautiful shirt and an ascot. And he looked like, he looked like Cary Grant. And he, he would walk around in this dusty warehouse, Western costume, which was not the Western costume it is now. It was located on Melrose in front of Paramount. And um, he was never dirty. I don't know how he never got dirty there, but he put together the most amazing, fabulous costumes you've ever seen in your life. And if you just followed him around for a day to pick his brain, you know, you, you would leave that night so much smarter. And, you know, your brain, would, my brain would be like, you know, going, oh, so that's how you put that together. Or, you know, add a pair of suspenders or, you know, you add like a character thing to a certain, you know, just a little tidbit to a, each costume. And uh, uh, those are the kind of guys that were my mentors. Uh, what are some of your favorite details to add to things? Speaking of suspenders and, and so forth, do you have any favorite um, accessories or? Um, well, I guess it depends what period you're working on, you know, but um, I think those those accessories are really important for characters, you know. Um, I, I, I've been always fascinated with hats. Um, you know, uh, when I was, uh, when I first started at Western, they had a, they had a big hat shop there. They have a hot hat shop now, but it's a little bit different than it was back then. But um, uh, the guy that used to run the hat shop at Western was a guy named Eddie Barone. And so he would, uh, I would go up sometimes and he'd say, are you busy right now? And say, uh, no, I'm not. Do you need some help? And he'd say, yeah, I have to steam 400 fedoras for, uh, you know, there was a movie called The Cotton Club with Richard Gere. And I was working at Western when they were prepping that. And he goes, yeah, I have to, I have to steam 400 fedoras. So, um, so um, I kind of fell in love with hats through him because we would steam the fedoras. I would help them steam the fedoras on these big steamers and shape them, you know, and we would, you know, give them all different shapes and, and steam them up and, you know, so kind of. What advice would you give to students who would like to follow in your footsteps? Well, I, uh, I tell young costumers that um, I have a saying that uh, somebody has to do the work. Uh, and you know, being in this business, some people come to our business and they don't really want to work. They want to, it's more about, I'm in the movie business <laughs> and, you know, they're trying to figure out a way to make the money and not work. Um, I would say if you really want to do this and you want to have a long career, it's so simple is Go back to my saying, somebody has to do the work. Come to work on time. Work really hard. Get along with everybody. And you will work all the time. And you don't even have to be a great customer to achieve those simple things. As you can be a good customer just by showing up on time, learning, being willing to learn different things and be willing to adapt to different work situations because go back to what we were talking about earlier is every show is different. So you may work with a supervisor who on this show does it this way, but the next show, the next supervisor will want it done that way. So you have to adapt to those different situations, just like a supervisors who um, have to adapt to different designer styles. Um, some costume designers like it one way and some like it the other. And so as a supervisor, I have to find a way to make that style work or say, hey, I, I usually do it this way you know, and you work it out, but you have to be adaptable to work different situations out. But um, I do, I do know one thing that uh, somebody has to do the work 
And so long as you're working hard and, and, and you're trying to get along with everybody, that's all you really need to know. What kind of skills would you like to see in new workers? I think that everybody should know the, the basic stuff of costuming, like, you know, how to, how to take somebody's sizes, um, you know, how, how to do measurements, um, you know, uh, know some basic terms of clothing, you know, know, know your periods. Um, and, uh, and if you, get a show that you don't know that particular period, do some homework on it before you show up to work. And then uh, some basic sewing skills, you know, for a customer is, um, you know, I can't, I can't uh, sew like you can. Um, I don't have those kind of skills, but um, you know, if you're a set costumer or a key costumer, you're put in a situation where you're going to have to do uh, some sort of uh, mending, uh, you're going to have to. Uh, on, on Dracula, most people don't know because you can't really tell because we did such a great job, but the gold cape with the jewels all on it when he pops out of the box, on take one at 11 o'clock at night on a stage at, uh, which is now Sony Studios, it was Lorimar back then, uh, the old MGM studio, he stepped on his cape coming out of the box and he tore it in half, Gary mm -hmm. Oldman and the jewels went flying everywhere. This was again, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> we didn't have, we couldn't call you uh, in the shop because you were in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so me and the set, me and the other set costumer and God bless him, the unsung hero of Dracula was this uh, assistant costume designer that unfortunately nobody, he never got any credit for Dracula, but I'm telling you, he was the unsung hero for Aiko, was a guy named Richard Shishley. And he was in the shop. The three of us sewed that cape back together in two hours with the help of a standby painter who was helping glue the jewels back on. But because I knew some basic sewing skills <laughs> and all the, then they did too, we were able to repair that cape and put it back on. And to this day, I don't think you can ever tell that that cape was ripped uh, in the shop. Yeah, but I know I've certainly seen my fair share of like hot glued on um, shirt buttons <laughs> and things where it's just like, oh, that, that seems so much harder than if you just would have sewn it. But you know, yeah. that's you do what you got to do to get stuff done though. Oh, you, that's oh, for sure. Yes. Hey, you do what you got to do on set to get that because uh, mm -hmm. you have, uh, you know, uh, Listen, I, on Dracula, we had Francis Ford Coppola breathing down your neck. As soon as, as, soon as that cape ripped, um, he was scanning the uh, crew looking for me. Uh, and as soon as he <sighs> spotted me, he said, well, he's got this mean look on his face. And he says, he goes, how long? <laughs> what do you think is the most important aspect to creating a successful collaborative environment? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one because you're dealing with so many different personalities. And you really don't know the personalities you're, you're dealing with sometimes until they're all in the room. Um, uh, again, I think it's just being open with everybody, communicating. Uh, and like, uh, I think in the beginning, even with our crew, we have a very large crew. And uh, I told all of you, if there's any problems, come to me first, you know, because uh, there might be somebody you're sitting close to that irritates the heck out of you. Well, then, you know, or they're doing, he or she's doing something to irritate you. So come to me first so we can figure it out. But, um, uh, you know, what's that saying? It all it starts from the top. So yeah, it starts from the top. So if you have a designer and a supervisor who is willing to communicate to the rest of the crew what their, what their needs are and what the look is gonna be, um, then it's, it's easier to all come together and, and, and get it done. You know, right now we have a fabulous designer who communicates really well and is open to 
uh, us saying, you know, it, it, we can't achieve that in this amount of time or for this kind of money, you know, so he he's willing to go, okay, well, then how about this way? What do you think are the, the um, hallmarks of a, of a well-run show? The hallmarks of it. Um, or signs or? I think um, it, it's a tough one because if it's a movie, before you know it's a good run show, it's almost over. You know, because <laughs> you know, your average movie is, is shot in 40 days. So um, it's, um, it's hard to, by the time you figure out if it's a well-run show, the movie's almost over. Uh, in a TV series, it's different. And I think one of the uh, ways you can tell is, uh, is continuity, is um, let's say a show's going for two or three years. Has there been a big turnover? You know, is there been three or four different designers in that three in that two or three years? Is there been, uh, which sometimes Ant says it yes and no. Like our show has been going for three seasons. We've actually had three designers, but our show is really well ran, so mm -hmm. it's a little deceiving. Um, but some shows, if they have three or four designers and a couple of seasons, it means there's usually trouble in paradise. You know, uh, if it has a bunch of different supervisors or, or. Uh, you know, a lot of personnel change, you know. Um, and sometimes that comes with budget too. Sometimes these shows give you unrealistic budgets and people take the shows because they really want to do it. Oh, I really want to work on that show. So they take the show knowing they don't have any money, but it's a really cool show. And then they go and they fail because you can't do a really cool, great show with no money. How do you do your homework when you're looking into a show and considering one versus another? Do you contact people that you look up the showrunners and be like, have, have you worked with this person before or? Um... Yeah, I mean, that's the great thing now about having IMDB and stuff like that. If uh, uh, you can, um, let's say uh, the designer calls me who I do know, let's say I know the designer and they say, well, <clears throat> this is the show, it's this production company, it's uh, the uh, UPM is so-and-so and the producer so-and-so. Before I say yes to the designer, I'll say, okay, well, let me think about that. And then I go do my homework on those producers and the, I, I go see the shows they've done and see if I know anybody that's worked with them and I'll call them and ask them, you know, how did they treat you guys, you know? Same way I do with a designer. If a designer calls me who I do not know, um, I'll listen to what they have. I won't say yes or no at that time. And then I go to home, I go, I go do my homework to find out who's worked with this designer before to find out, you know, um, I, do I want to work with them? So do you have any strategies for when you're negotiating, uh, your contracts? Uh, what, what do you like to do when you're negotiating your contract? Well, again, that comes with doing the homework, what kind of show it is. Um, sometimes because, you know, we are pretty lucky. We have, we, we have pretty good rates and whether people complain about it or not, we have a really great pension and, and we have, we have healthcare. Yes. So um, we can't forget all of those things. So a lot of the shows you're going to work on, they're only going to offer you scale. Uh, and um, before you start negotiating, you if, if you are an above scale person, uh, then there's only certain shows that are going to pay that, and those are the big budget movies or uh, or a um, maybe a big budget TV series. Um, but it really depends on your position in the department, and it also depends on you being able to say willing to say no. Um, I was in, uh, there is a, our union two or three years ago, they've been working on pay equity, uh, our rates compared to different rates in other, other unions and IATSE unions. And so ours is a little bit lower than most of the others. So they're trying to bump that up, uh, which is 
tough too because you know we have a straight three percent raise across the board but the problem with that three percent raise is all the other locals are making more money than us so their three percent becomes a lot higher than our three percent because three percent on fifty five dollars an hour is a lot more than three dollars than three percent on thirty eight dollars an hour so so every time there's a three percent raise they get further and further ahead of us very true so yes so negotiating rates is is tricky because you have to be willing to say no meaning um when i went to this pay equity thing i was in with three or four other, it was like five customers and three of them said well i'm working on a show that only will pay scale and um and uh they won't even, they won't even give us a car rental. And I said, well, then uh, I, I didn't mean it to be meanly. I was just being saying it out loud is I said, that's a you problem. Meaning, and there's not many costume supervisors. So for young people that are listening to this, that's one thing is there's a million set customers and there's a million people that want to work in the trailer but there's not a lot of people that want to supervise. And so um, the supervisor thing, we are in control, meaning uh, there's not a lot out there. So if you get offered a show and you think that you are worth more than the scale, then you just say, this is what I get. And if they say, well, all, I ha all we have is scale, then I just say, then, uh, you know, no hard feelings, but this, this, this is not the show for me, you know? Um, and, and, and I say that in the nicest of ways, this is not the show for me. This is what I usually get. And, um, you know, and so one of those costumers, uh, did that on her next show. And I got a nice text saying that, uh, uh, she used my strategy. And they came back and offered her another two or three dollars an hour, and uh, it's the first time she ever just said no. That's you know, that's not going to work for me. And I said, yeah, you have to be willing to walk away. And um, I, because I think in most cases, if you're willing to walk away and they really want you, they're going to pay the extra couple dollars an hour, um, especially if you're a supervisor. Now, some of the other positions are a little more. Again, it's, it's, it's how long have you been in the business? You know, how, what shows have you done? You know, it's in the beginning, it's really hard to get anything but scale, but as you, as you work and, um, build up some credits and build up some reputation and, 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 and be sure that you're reliable and you do good work that's when you can start negotiating more money. You yeah. found a lot of heavy hitters. It is, it is an impressive group. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, first of all, you have to build up a good, good, some credits, build up a reputation, and then you can ask for more money and stand by it. So, um, is there anything you would like to plug in general? Um, or, any advice that we haven't already covered that you'd like to get out there for either the general public or for the students that are likely to see this? One of the things I'd like to say is, is sometimes people get stuck on in costuming. Like, do you remember that? Um, and I think the first time I ever met you, I met you on one of those speed uh, uh, interview things where uh, you, yes. have, you got 40 seconds. You got 40 seconds to, you know, uh, pitch to some supervisor or designer on, on your skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for you young costumers, so I had so many people that day say, um, I just want to work in the trailer or I just want to be a set customer or I just want to do this. I will say as a supervisor, I like hiring people that can do everything. Meaning. I know there's different uh, uh, positions in our union, but I want a costumer who is willing to do anything in the department we need to achieve a great looking costume and to achieve us getting it done 
on time, looking great, uh, whether that be something out of your comfort zone or not. So I always say is try to learn how to age a little bit, have some basic sewing skills, know how to work the set, know your sink on set, uh, um, know how to iron, know how to steam, uh, know how to do a little bit of everything. And don't be hooked on just, I want to be a set costumer or a trailer costumer or, you know, and in this days, and then uh, I probably, and I'm not even great at this, but I'm trying is, is you got to know the, got to know the computer stuff and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. The more, you know, the more, you know, the, the better you can get more work. You can get more work knowing more. You know, um, I like hiring customers that can do a couple, three, four different things. That way, especially in today's world where somebody goes down on because of COVID or they get sidelined or something like that. And you saw that in our, our own department, people go down. We have such a good crew. I just put, you know, one person goes down. I just move that person into that position because they know how to do it. Because I don't have a bunch of people that can only do one thing. I have a bunch of customers that can do three or four things. So, so try to know as uh, much as you can to make yourself as valuable as you can. Do you want me to um, incl include a link to your business in the, the um, section below the video? Uh, oh, my, uh, my, uh, my side gig, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> sure, that would be great. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, any further parting remarks or anything? No, I, I think, think we thinking. got a lot of really good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. All right. All right. You take care. I'll see you soon. All right.